Reproduction is a key characteristic of all living things, and cells, either representing an entire living organism, in the case of unicellular organisms, or part of a multicellular organism, are no different. They have to have the ability to reproduce. Cells reproduce through several different mechanisms, binary fission in prokaryotes, mitosis or meiosis in eukaryotic cells. But all of these are controlled by a process known as the cell cycle, which is the orderly sequence of events that leads up to cell division in living cells. That's what we're going to talk about today, so stay tuned while we talk about the cell cycle. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Today we're talking about the cell cycle. The cell cycle is the orderly sequence of events that leads up to a single cell dividing into two daughter cells. Now the cell cycle in all cells needs to be tightly regulated. And the reason why is that uncontrolled cell replication is invariably harmful. In unicellular organisms, where replication functionally means reproduction, dividing at an inappropriate time could lead to the death of both daughter cells. In multicellular organisms, uncontrolled cell death leads to tumor formation and oncogenesis or cancer formation. As a result, this process is tightly regulated in all cell types. Now, there are many different types of cell division. For example, if we're talking about a prokaryotic cell, which are exclusively unicellular organisms, cell replication is essentially the reproduction of that organism, and they typically divide through a process known as binary fission. If we're talking about eukaryotic cells, there are two different types of cell replication that can occur, mitosis and meiosis. Now, we're not going to get bogged down in the details of mitosis and meiosis in this video. We'll talk about those in a separate video, specifically talking about mitosis and meiosis. However, there are some significant similarities between mitosis and meiosis, as well as some significant differences between mitosis and meiosis. For example, mitosis is going to occur in somatic cells, which are the body cells. It's going to occur in cells that are diploid and result in the production of two identical diploid daughter cells. When we refer to diploid, what we're referring to is a cell that has two copies of each chromosome. So for example, if we're looking at a human somatic cell, there will be two copies each of 23 chromosomes. That is our diploid number. If we're talking about meiosis, on the other hand, meiosis is going to occur in a subset of cells known as gametes, which are our reproductive cells, the sperm and the egg. Meiosis is referred to as reductive cell division, and the reason why is although the process starts with a diploid cell, it will end up with four non-identical haploid daughter cells. In other words, these daughter cells will be non-identical, unlike mitosis, but will also include only a haploid number of chromosomes. In the case of human sperm and eggs, those are 23 chromosomes, one copy each of the 23 chromosomes found in a human cell. Meiosis is also set up in a way where it encourages genetic diversity. And this makes perfect sense because what we're trying to do is, in, in the case of producing reproductive cells, is increase the diversity of the species. The production of haploid cells is important when we're talking about gametes because gametes are involved in sexual reproduction, and then the fusion of two haploid gametes results in the production of a diploid zygote. So for example, a 23 chromosome carrying haploid sperm fuses with a 23 chromosome haploid egg in the case of human reproduction, leading to a diploid 46 chromosome containing zygote. Now, as I mentioned prior, we're not going to be talking about the, the details of mitosis and meiosis. Rather, we're going to focus on the processes that lead up to the physical division of the two cells and of the genetic information. This process is known as the cell cycle. So the cell cycle, regardless of which type of reproduction we're talking about, is going to be tightly guarded. And if we look at the cell cycle, it's divided into two major parts. The first part is called interphase, and the second part is known as either the mitotic or the meiotic phase, depending on which cell type we're talking about. During interphase, the cell is going to be developing the resources that it's needed to divide. It's going to be producing the energy needed. Again, cell reproduction is an incredibly energetically costly adventure. So there's going to be a lot of energy needed to do this. During interphase, the cell is also going to be synthesizing the, the genetic information needed. So it's going to have to replicate its genome. It's going to also require the production of numerous proteins and other cellular components needed for this process to occur. So there's going to be lots of transcription and translation leading up to the physical division of the two cells. 
Interphase is followed either by the meiotic or the mitotic phase, depending on the cell type. And during that particular phase, this is where two things are going to happen. The first part is called karyokinesis, which is the physical separation of the genetic information, followed by cytokinesis, which is the physical division of the two cells or of the single cell into two daughter cells. Now, if we look more closely at interphase, which is largely going to be the focus of this video, interphase is actually broken down into three smaller phases known as gap phase one, gap phase two, and S phase or the synthesis phase. And if we look at a cell in each of these different sub phases of interphase, we'll see that different activities are actually occurring. So first, let's start with G1 or gap phase one. If you look at a cell under a microscope, when the cell is in G1, you really wouldn't notice anything superficially different about that cell. It's just going to look like a cell undergoing normal cell processes. But if you look at the cell at the metabolic level, there is a lot happening. So a cell in G1 is going to be synthesizing a ton of energy because it, the next step in the process is going to be replicating its genome in a very energetically costly adventure. They're also going to be transcribing and translating the various proteins that are going to be needed in order to do DNA replication and get the cell ready metabolically for the next step. Now, the end of G1 is actually going to be guarded by one of the first cell cycle checkpoints. So as we'll learn, there are actually three different distinct checkpoints within the cell cycle. And these checkpoints are incredibly important because these checkpoints are going to guard the process, the, the, the proceeding of the cell from one phase of, of, my, of the cell cycle into the next. There are three different phases, three different checkpoints. The first one is the one at the end of G1 is known as the G1 checkpoint. The G1 checkpoint is going to require the cell to interpret both internal and external signals in order to determine whether it's to proceed to the next step of the cell cycle known as the S phase. Now, if you recall our conversation about cell signaling and signal transduction, there are various processes and various pathways that can end up controlling whether or not a cell continues on the reproduction pathway. And this is kind of where a lot of that information is going to be interpreted. So first, let's take a look at some of the internal signals that will be checked in on at the G1 checkpoint or prior to the G1 checkpoint. When a cell gets to the G1 checkpoint internally, it's going to have to have several different pieces of information that will allow it to proceed to the S phase. The first one is, does the cell have enough energy? Are there enough energetic resources to move on to the next step? The second thing the cell is going to have to consider is, hey, do I have all of the necessary proteins or all of the enzymes present? And this is particularly important because when we get into the S phase, the next, the next phase of interphase, the cell is going to be replicating its genome. And when DNA replication is going on, nothing else can be happening. There will be no further transcription or no further translation. If the cell doesn't have enough energy, it's not going to be able to produce the metabolic enzymes needed to produce it. If it doesn't have all the proteins needed to do DNA replication, the cell is not going to be able to pause replication in order to transcribe and then translate those proteins. So all of those things need to be in place. But perhaps the most important internal checkpoint that needs to be crossed off is, is there any damage to the DNA? Because if the genomic information of that cell is damaged and can't be repaired, then that cell should not proceed on to the point of S phase. It should not replicate its genome. Externally, there are certain cues that will need to be interpreted as well. Cells need both internal input as well as external input in order to replicate. Important extracellular conditions that need to be met, for example, is, are they getting the signals from other parts of the cell? So if you recall, there are things such as growth hormones that are produced by distinct tissues or distinct organs or glands within the body. Are those growth hormones present? These growth hormones push the cell into the cell, replication, the cell reproduction pathway. Another important cue is something called contact inhibition. Cells that are involved in tissues if they are contacted on all sides by other cells, that is an indication that no further cell division is necessary, that tissue is intact. However, if there is no contact on part of the cell, it might indicate that the tissue is damaged and the division of that cell is needed to repair that damage. In order for the cell to go past the G1 checkpoint and enter S phase, both the internal checkpoints need to be satisfied as well as the external checkpoints need to be satisfied. The G1 checkpoint is probably the most crucial checkpoint of all of the cell cycle checkpoints during the cell cycle. The reason why is once a cell passes past G1 into S phase, that cell is now 
committed. It is an irreversible step. Once the cell passes into S phase, there are only two fates left open for that cell. The first one is division. We'll go through the entire process and either d divide through mitosis or meiosis. The second one is death. And the main reason why is once the cell goes through this checkpoint, it will have done some things that, that will make it so that cell can no longer function as a normal cell as part of that body. And if it can't make it through the entire division process, then it will undergo apoptosis and remove itself from the body. So let's look first at what might happen if those checkpoint requirements aren't satisfied. First, what if those external signals have not been received? What if there is contact inhibition? What if there are no growth hormones? Well, then the cell might opt to exit the cell cycle entirely and enter something called G0. It's abbreviated as G with a little zero next to it. A cell in G0 is essentially just left the cell cycle. It doesn't mean the cell is dead. It just simply means the cell is going to go about doing whatever that cell does. If it's a liver cell, it's going to do what a liver cell does. If it's a skin cell, it's going to do what a skin cell does. It's just not going to divide. The cool part about a cell in G0 is for the most part, with a few exceptions, which we'll talk about in a minute, that cell can rapidly re-enter the cell cycle if those exter external signals are received. So for example, if a skin cell can't undergo replication because it's contacted on all sides by other skin cells, but all of a sudden a wound forms and there's damage and that contact inhibition no longer exists, that cell has now received the external cue for, hey, I need to divide to repair that damage. It can then hop back into the cell cycle and undergo the remainder of the cell cycle and the replication process. However, there are some cells that enter G0 terminally. These are cells such as most neurons and cardiomyocytes. Once they're done dividing through the process of development, they are in permanent G0. They enter a state where they can no longer go back into the cell cycle and divide. And that is why things such as traumatic brain injuries, spinal cord injuries, and infarct formation from heart attacks is so problematic. Because those neurons in the brain, those neurons that form the spinal cord or those cells that make up the cardiac muscles can no longer divide even though the tissue has been damaged and the damage for, therefore is permanent. On the other hand, what if a cell cannot enter into the remainder of the cell cycle because there's internal problems? Because for example, there's too much DNA damage. Well, the cell will pause at this checkpoint for a little while and it will allow the cell to try to repair itself, repair its genome. But if it pauses for too long and that DNA damage cannot be repaired, the cell will then undergo apoptosis and remove itself from the body. This is a very important step in multicellular organisms because this step is what's important for preventing cancer and tumor formation. If a cell senses too much cellular damage that it can't be repaired, then that cell will remove itself from the body rather than divide and carries problems on to the next generation. So let's say then the cell receives all the important external and internal cues and is able to proceed past the G1 checkpoint. The next step is S phase or the synthesis phase. This is where all the things we talked about in our lecture on DNA replication come into play. This is where you have origins of replication and leading strands and lagging strands and Okazaki fragments and DNA polymerase and single-stranded binding proteins and helicase and topoisomerase. This is where this all comes into play during the S phase of the cell cycle. This process will complete Will, will occur until all of the genomic information has been duplicated. If you're a prokaryotic cell, this will be the replication of your single circular DNA chromosome. If you are a eukaryotic cell, so for example, if you're a human being that we're talking about, this is a human cell we're talking about, all 46 of those chromosomes will have been duplicated, resulting in a cell that now contains 92 chromosomes. And at this point, I hope you can see why once a cell enters into S phase, it's sort of committed to the process. A human cell cannot exist and function normally with 92 chromosomes. Therefore, if this process is somehow interrupted for whatever reason, this cell will have to go under uh, will have to undergo apoptosis and remove itself from the body because it can't function with this number of chromosomes. S phase proceeds directly without a checkpoint into gap phase 2 or G2. G2 is a period of rest and recovery. This is where the cell is going to replenish its energy reserves. Remember, DNA replication is very energetically costly. It's also going to begin translating uh, the proteins needed to do mitosis or meiosis, whichever the next step is going to be. Now, the end of G2 is guarded by the second cell cycle checkpoint, the G2 checkpoint. The G2 checkpoint is going to, of course, make sure that the cell is ready for the for the division process does it have enough energy does it have the right proteins in place 
but most importantly, it's going to do some surveillance on the genomic information. It's going to check to make sure that there is no DNA damage following the replication process. It's also going to check to make sure that all of the chromosomes have been duplicated are, and are ready to proceed to the next step. Once the cell recognizes that all the genomic information has in fact been duplicated and the cell is ready to proceed, it will then move into the mitotic or the meiotic phase, which will be followed by which will include karyokinesis followed by cytokinesis and finish off the cell cycle. What I want to talk about now is how are these checkpoints, how is the cell cycle actually regulated at the molecular level? In most part, the cell cycle is driven by the activity of various proteins. Some of these proteins are positive regulators of the cell cycle, while others are the negative regulators of the cell cycle. You can think about it this way. If the cell cycle were a car, the positive regulators would be the gas pedal. They would be the accelerator, pushing the cell through the process of cell division. The negative regulators, on the other hand, would be the brakes. They would be slowing the cell cycle down or pausing the cell cycle where needed particularly at various checkpoints, to ensure that everything in the cell is ready to go on to the next step. The two most prominent positive regulators of the cell cycle are going to be two types of proteins, the cyclins and the cyclin-dependent kinases, also known as the CDKs. Now, cyclins, as their name implies, their expression levels vary throughout the cell cycle. So, for example, during G1, towards the end of G1, around the G1 checkpoint, cyclin E levels are very, very high but then it drops as the cell enters into S phase. And, at the, and then as we get towards the end of S phase, it's going to be cyclin A that becomes very uh, highly expressed. And then that will drop off as we get into G2. And at the end of G2, it's cyclin B whose levels are very, very high in the cell. So they kind of cycle throughout the cell cycle, their expression does. On the other hand, cyclin dependent kinase expression levels don't change very much at all. They're kind of always present at low levels throughout the entirety of the cell cycle. But as their name implies, cyclin-dependent kinases, or CDKs, are only active when their particular cyclin binding partner is present. So only cyclin-dependent kinase or CDK cyclin complexes are actually active at the same time. So for example, cyclin B CDK complexes are only active when cyclin B levels are high at the end of G2. Cyclin E CDK complexes are only active around the G1 checkpoint when cyclin E levels are very high. And in this way, cyclin-dependent kinases are able to influence the cell cycle. Now, again, as their name implies, cyclin-dependent kinases are, in fact, kinases. And if you recall, a kinase is an enzyme that adds a phosphate group to proteins, which, either, which influences their activity, either inhibiting them or activating them. And that is exactly how CDKs go about their business. When cyclin-CDK complexes form, the CDK becomes active. It then phosphorylates various proteins that drive the cell cycle forward. When their particular cyclin is absent, CDKs are inactive and no longer influence the activity of their target proteins. There, of course, are also negative regulators of the cell cycle. Negative regulators of the cell cycle typically function at various checkpoints throughout the cell cycle and help to act as the brakes to slow down the cell cycle. The most important negative, regu negative regulators of the cell cycle are proteins called P53, P21, and RB. All of these proteins function actually at the G1 checkpoint to help delay the movement through the cell cycle when they are active. Their activity, specifically at the G1 checkpoint, shouldn't come as a major surprise. Because if you recall, the G1 checkpoint really is sort of the make or break point for the cell cycle. Once the cell passes through the G1 checkpoint, it is committed either to division or to death. So it makes sense that these three very important regulators of the cell cycle do their work at this very crucial juncture of the cell cycle. So let's talk about what these proteins do. The first one I'll talk about is P53. Now, P53 is a protein that isn't expressed at very high levels throughout the majority of the cell cycle. In fact, P53 really only becomes active and expressed in very high levels when there is widespread DNA damage. And when the DNA repair pathways come online to repair this damage, P53 becomes expressed much more highly and becomes active and actually accumulates in the nucleus. And what P53 does is it acts to influence the positive regulators of the cell cycle and sort of inactivate them while those DNA repair process, uh, processes are going on. It actually does this through another protein called P21. P53 activates P21. P21, once active, can then interact with cyclin CDK complexes, inhibiting their activity. So by inhibiting cyclin CDK complexes, they prohibit 
the pro cell cycle activity of those cyclin CDK complexes, thus putting the brakes on the cell cycle right at the G1 checkpoint. This inhibition of the cell cycle will persist while the cell attempts to repair its DNA damage. However, if this inhibition, if this delay, if this pause at the G1 checkpoint lasts too long, P21 is actually able to influence apoptosis. It promotes the apoptotic cascade because in short, a prolonged delay of the cell cycle through the activity of P53 and P21 is an indicator that there is widespread DNA damage that cannot be repaired. And therefore it is appropriate for that cell to undergo the apoptotic cascade and remove itself from the body. Another very important negative regulator of the cell cycle is RB. So RB is a protein that predominantly influences the ability of the cell to proceed through the cell cycle by interacting with a transcription factor called E2F. So E2F is a transcription factor that is involved in activating uh, several different genes that are required for the cell to move through the cell cycle. RB, when activated, can directly interact with E2F and inhibit E2F activity, thereby preventing the expression of those genes needed to proceed throughout the cell cycle. RB can also have another influence on gene transcription. It's also able to recruit histone deacetylases. So remember HDACs. If you remember our conversation about what histone deacetylases do, histone deacetylases actually go through and they all help to transform euchromatin into heterochromatin. So RB is also able to inhibit gene expression of those E2F target genes by modifying the chromatin and regulating it through epigenetic regulation of gene expression as well. However, RB can be inactivated via phosphorylation, and that is done by cyclin CDK complexes. So when those cyclin CDK complexes become highly active, they will phosphorylate and inactivate RB, thereby permitting the cell to move through the cell cycle. When we talk about the genes that encode P53, P21, and RB, those genes are actually referred to as tumor suppressor genes. And the reason why is that these genes, their functional output, normally the activity of those proteins is to inhibit progression through the cell cycle and thus are important safeguards against the formation of tumors and oncogenesis. It should come as no surprise then that in many different types of cancers, mutations that inhibit the ability of RB P53 or P21 to function are, have been discovered. Conversely, there are also mutations or genes that are referred to as proto-oncogenes. Many of these are genes that encode proteins that are positive regulators of the cell cycle. Perhaps the most widely known example of a proto-oncogene is the RAS gene. RAS is a signal molecule that is activated that promotes cell division. And when mutations occur in RAS that it pre prevent it from being inhibited, in other words, it's constantly active, this is sort of akin to having the accelerator of a car mashed to the floor at all times. It doesn't matter how, fat, how hard you apply the brakes, the car is going to keep moving forward. And that's what happens. And indeed, it has been discovered that in about 30% of all cancers, there are mutations in the RAS gene that lead it to be constitutively active or constantly active throughout the cell cycle, thus promoting movement and cell movement through the cell cycle and cell replication. So as you can see, the cell cycle is a highly regulated orderly process for determining when a cell is going to divide and when it's not going to divide. This process needs to be tightly regulated to prevent cells from dividing at inappropriate times. This could prevent the death of organisms in the case of unicellular organisms, but it can also prevent the formation of tumors and oncogenesis in multicellular organisms. In our next video, we're going to talk specifically about the processes of mitosis and meiosis, the differences and the similarities between them. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you've learned a lot and I look forward to talking to you again real soon.